What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 12 of Breaking Bats, presented by Not For Long Media. I am Brian O'Grady, your host. With me is my co-host, Justin Ayers. It is very early in Japan. I'm struggling a little bit, but podcast doesn't rest. We are here grinding. J.A., what's going on, brother? I'm good, man. Uh, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Breaking Bats TikTok account. Our, our video with last week's guest, Matt Strom, is almost at a million views. So we need to do everything we can to push it over the hump and get our guy Matt Strom a milli milli because his story about almost getting cut from Juco baseball is electric. And all the comments are really, really funny. They love the part where the guy on his team was peeing blood from the conditioning test. So <laughs> please, please go check it out. I think it's at Breaking Bats Pod on TikTok. That is, that's, that's an all timer. Yeah, that's really cool, man. A million views is a, is a, is a lot for sure. Strom, Strom was great. The stories are, are really cool. And yeah, you said it before we started recording, man, there's a serious Juco baseball community on social media in general now, thanks to uh, I think old Eric Sim there, but uh, it's just cool, man. That's, um, that's crazy. Uh yeah, we had Strom last week, and this week, uh, before we talk about some MLB things, our guest is Pete Fairbanks, who is phenomenal. We made the interview a little bit quicker because I was running late, but Pete is one of a kind, um, working back from an injury right now, uh, and we'll talk more about this in a couple minutes, but uh, definitely a great one. Big fan of Pete, uh, good friend of mine, and he's just uh, – He's funny, man. But uh, what do we got on deck for today in the MLB? So for our MLB segment to lead off, we're going to do some of the biggest surprises. We're about a month into the baseball season now, and there's been a lot of storylines, a lot of individual things that have stuck out, a lot of team things, both good and bad, that have kind of stuck out. So I have about a half dozen of them. We kind of run through them here. Uh, the first one I have is, is the Cincinnati Reds. And just how poorly they have started this season. They are three and 19, and that is on pace to be the worst record in Major League Baseball history. Uh, that's a 136 winning percentage if you're following along at home. And that's very close. The 1899 Cleveland Spiders went 20 and 134. That's the all time like Major League Baseball lowest achievement award for that. But it's bad, dude. I don't know if you've looked at some of their numbers. They have the worst team ERA in baseball, they have the second worst average. I mean, have you kind of been like keeping tabs on, on your old team, the Cincinnati Reds uh, so far? Yeah, I, I always check on everybody, but I have noticed um, still have a decent amount of Reds fans that follow me on Twitter and that keep me somewhat updated on uh, those things. But they've it, it's been an unfortunate start to the year for them. Obviously, that record is rough. They've had a good amount of injuries happen as well which which is uh obviously hurt them a lot but you know I feel I feel sad for it, it's it's just been a debacle of a start to the year for them because everything with uh Phil Castellini what he said and um you know stuff that Castellanos has been saying about them uh but what I mean he said they didn't even call him. That's, I mean, how do you not even? I know he was, you know, he's going to make some money, and chances are they probably weren't going to be able to pay him that, but not even call the guy and try to get him back somehow. It seemed like he liked it there as far as, you know, playing, but money, money is obviously a big, a big thing too. It's, it's tough, man. Cincinnati's a great baseball town. It's a great baseball town. The fans love it there. They will support that team, they will be there. But three and three and what you say? What is it? Three and nineteen. Three and twenty. Yeah, three and nineteen. Three and nineteen. I mean, it's not fun. I feel bad for the players who were there too because that's you're not. It's that's that's really rough. It's really rough. You're right, and, and they're already starting to look forward to, or not look forward, but they're they're already starting to project which guys are going to be traded at the deadline. We're, we're a pro Joey Votto podcast. I want that on the record, but he hasn't, the bat hasn't really gotten going so far this year. He's hitting 122. Uh, and Jonathan, India, uh, I think it's like his second trip on the IL already. So a lot of injuries, a lot of guys not getting going. And it's just, yeah, rough going there uh, in Cincinnati. So um, kind of rough. That, that's a big surprise. That's our first one. 
Uh, my next biggest surprise is how good the New York Mets are and specifically how good their pitching is without Jacob deGrom. I know they're your World Series pick for this year. Uh, I wanted to write them off so bad as soon as Jacob deGrom got hurt. I'm like, oh, whew, that's it. All right, that's curtains for them. Uh, they have the six, the sixth best ERA in baseball, and they have the second best whip and average against. And uh, a little, a guy named Tyler McGill, second year guy, four zero with a sub two. And obviously, Max Scherzer is doing what Max Scherzer does. But that's that's pretty good picking on your part. They got a good team, man. They really do. They that pitching's great. Obviously, missing Degrom, but the other guys, McGill is obviously a huge pitching unbelievably right now but Scherzer I mean Taiwan Walker um and then that lineup man they have they have a good roster they really do so I and Buck Show Walter knows what he's doing so I don't know I I'm I am a slightly surprised at how well they're playing to start I will say that especially like you said without the ground but I don't know, man. They just uh, – this team seems different. They made the move. They got rid of Robinson Cano, which is kind of sad, kind of – I mean, I was hoping they would do that. It seemed like the right baseball move. They got to eat a lot of money. But, uh, you know, he's just uh, – he's getting older. He's uh, not really, you know, part-time player now, not really a guy you're going to stick in there every day with the – the other people they have, but man, they, I like their, I like their off season additions in the, the lineup too. Starling Marte is a really good player. Um, Mark Hanna is a very good player. Uh, can't remember who else, but they just, they got some guys, man. They really do. It's, uh, it's cool to see. And the, obviously the other uh, two New York teams are two best records in uh, baseball right now. The Yankees are right there with them too, which I did not predict but there's a lot of season to go. Absolutely. Yeah. I think you said it best. There's just a well-constructed, very solid top to bottom Buck Showalter. Obviously I'm a big Buck Showalter guy. They're still having the thing where they're having to like, he got suspended for a game. And then at the, the start of the, I think it was a relief pitcher got three games. Yeah. Why, why is this still a thing where a month in and we're still doing New York Mets getting hit and hitting people? Like, why hasn't that died off? <laughs> Dude, I was watching that. I was watching that last game with the Phillies too. And it, it's this, this is the part about it that sucks. It's like now that at any time it happens, it's automatically something. It's not just, you got, you, you know, you got hit. They were uh, Lindor. I forget who it was from the Phillies, but Lindor got hit in the like thigh. It wasn't, you know, they weren't throwing at him. It just happened. But right away, it's, now, because of everything, everything else that happened, it's just, it's just like, well, here we go again. And then, I don't know. I was watching it when the, the guy, uh, yeah, the reliever, his name's uh, Yoan Lopez. And uh, I was watching it. And did he – I can't even remember now that I'm thinking about it. Schwarber hit two homers that game. And he didn't, he didn't hit Schwarber at first. Did he end up hitting him? No, so you're right. It was Schwarber. It was two inside back to back, and then I yeah. forget what the outcome of the at bat was. And then Bone comes up and wears one in the back. Yeah, you're right. Yep, that's what it was. Yeah, but Schwarber. I mean, the Mets were winning the game by a couple of runs. It was it was it was basically over. But Schwarber, you know, he to me watching. I wasn't thinking, oh, he's throwing at Schwarber because he hit two homers and they hit Lindor. I you know, I know Buck, Buck's old school and um, is protecting is protecting his guys, and the Mets have already cultivated that kind of reputation this year that we're not going to you know, take shit, and if you hit us, we're going to hit you back, which whatever. But I don't know. I didn't really see it like that. And then, boom, Lopez was kind of all over the place, to be honest. It's not like he was sitting <laughs> – he wasn't just dotting, you know, pounding wherever he wanted. He was all over the place. So, boom – Bone react. I mean, he got hit square. Yes, he got hit square in the back, so or like rib. So I'm sure it didn't feel good. And his reaction was probably just more of a "fuck that hurt" reaction as opposed to "I think he's throwing at me" reaction. But Camargo hit a home run, got him kind of close in the game. But it's, 
I just think it gets overplayed. I got hit yesterday with two strikes up and in, you know, after the lefty was throwing me down away the whole time. I knew he wasn't, fr- you know, he knew he wasn't trying to hit me. Where, you know, just where, because where he, you ended up in the elbow. I hit in the elbow. Like, oh, okay. But he went fat. Yeah. He was everything cutters, sliders down and away. And then he's trying to sneak one in there and, you know, probably trying to go up and in top of the zone, you know, and just kind of uh, hit me, whatever. I'm fine. But I, I, my first reaction was, you know, in the moment is, is kind of, you get mad and you get, I don't know, kind of surprised, but you get so used to it because the vast majority of time it doesn't happen. So you just, that first like second is weird. And I was kind of, I kind of dropped the bat like, like that. But then I knew he didn't hit me off. Right? That, that it's done, you know. If they don't, pitchers aren't always trying to hit you if they hit you. They're not, you, sometimes the ball gets away. It's the truth. So I don't know. I'm, I'm a, oh, there's, you can tell when people are hitting you on purpose. So I hope, I hope the Mets don't do this all year where they get, they get, somebody gets hit and it's, it's got to be this thing every single time. I have two really quick things on that. Uh, I was listening to Joe West, the umpire. He was on part of my take the other day and he was, they they asked him, they were like, did you know when somebody was getting hit on purpose? And he's like, yeah, if you, if you've umpired the game for long enough, you know, which ones are intentional, which ones aren't. So I just thought that was really cool. I love cowboy Joe West. Now I just, I I didn't like him when he was umpiring, but hearing him now he's so well-spoken. Uh, and then the other one was you always hear like there's a good and a bad place to get hit. Obviously, the bad place is up around the dome. But like, is there tr- is there truly a good place to get hit where it won't hurt as bad? Is it like Sean Murphy when he took one in the ass? Is that is that the best place to get hit? Yeah, if they're the, the rule is if you're throwing at somebody, you're trying to hit them in the ass. Yeah. OK, because it's the yeah, if you hit somebody in the face bad. or head, but face, you know there's a lot that can go wrong there or anywhere in that area. You can get hit. If you get hit in the hand, you can break something, whatever back. None of it feels good. I'm not going to sit here and tell you any of it feels good. It doesn't, <laughs> but it's like Arenado said, he knew it was kind of, he, he knew it was coming. And a lot of guys, I told a story about Joey Wendell on here before when Tanaka hit him. A lot of guys still kind of respect that part of the game. They understand it and, you know, they accept the fact that they might wear one for whatever, whatever happened. So, but if you throw it somewhere near a guy's head, then you're getting, then people are going to have issues with that. Ed hunting. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. We'll keep it rolling. Your guy, your, your AL Cy Young pick, Kevin Gaussman. He's one of my biggest surprises. Because, you know, last year he was an all-star for the Giants. I think he was sixth in Cy Young voting. We're like, oh, that was cool. Can he do it again? He's absolutely done it again. And in Toronto, and it'll, I think that's more of a hitter-friendly ballpark anyway. But there's a great stat I saw. It was over a span of four starts. He faced 95 batters. He didn't allow a walk or a home run, and he struck out 31. So, again, great great prediction on your part. That's unbelievable. That. That's phenomenal. Gauze is he he's nasty, man. He's um he's really figured out and honed that top of the zone heater with his splitter. His I'm telling you, I, I see it every fucking game here now. Splitters are a devastating pitch. But truly, they really are. They are a tough pitch to pick up. They throw them hard and they they drop. It looks like a fastball at the belt until it's in the fucking dirt and you already swung. Uh he throws splitter in the major leagues. Probably him. I mean, Darvish and Otani, the other two that come to mind right away. Japanese guys, of course. Uh, but that, I mean, it's 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 not a fun at bat. And like, if he's not walking, guys, what are you gonna do? I mean, that's that's amazing. Uh, those numbers are. If he keeps that up, my prediction is definitely right. Those numbers are fantastic. I am a proxy Jays fan too. I like that team. Uh, and my friend Ghost Kakato as well. But uh, man, that is a serious run he's on right now. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think of Toronto as being this place where the ball flies, like 
you don't really think of it as a place. I mean, I, I, they just had the Cy Young Award winner last year, Rob, Rob, Robbie Ray, right? Um, so, you know, I guess he, they're kind of bucking all of those trends. The other one, sticking in the AL East for surprises, Anthony Rizzo is your MLB home run leader. Nine homers, 23 games. I did the math. I'm not usually a math guy, but he's on pace for 63 this year, uh, which that would be amazing if he could keep doing that. But does this does this trouble you? I went and looked, and seven of those nine, they were at home, and then four of those travel less than 380. So kind of cheap, but what do you think? Yeah, they – I mean, the short portion, right, in Yankee Stadium, I, I you can't knock it. He's doing what – he's just playing to the ballpark. He stands on top of the plate anyway, so – Maybe he wanted to, to pull the ball. He pulls the ball really well. His uh, He's just got a good swing. But do I think this run's going to keep going? No, I don't think so. He's uh, he's not that strict kind of power guy, but it is a short Porsche to run, right? The Yankees are rolling right now. It's a good place. It, it, it is very short there. I will say that. But been there, played there. It is a uh, – it's a short porch. It really is. So I'm trying to think of who I, I, I don't know who I got as home run champion this year. Who do you think is going to, who do you think is going to hit the most home runs? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. Let's, I mean, it's, it's Rizzo. Here are your, your top five. It's Rizzo, Crone, Judge, Jordan Alvarez, Byron Buxton, Jose Ramirez. Like, I, I don't know. I might, Judge, maybe? I mean, Judge is already having a good start. And that feels like a safe pick. I think Judge, I think I saw Judge's homer to, in seven of eight or something like that. It's pretty good. Judge is, yeah. le- I mean, he, he's legit. Judge Judge has legit pop. Not that Rizzo has legit pop, too, but you just you just said it. A lot of those are Yankee Stadium or course. aided home runs. But uh, that's where he plays. Yeah, you can't, I mean, can't knock it, but uh, – I dude Buxton, Buxton can hit. Buxton's got some pop. Uh and Jordan Alvarez was out for a little bit too. So if he's still up there, man, that dude can swing it. So a lot of time left. I think Judge is is, is a pretty safe bet, though. Yeah. But dude, the Yank the Yankees. I'm sticking with what I said before. The but the Red Sox are playing are pre, are playing pretty poor baseball right now. Sorry, Carabas, but uh, I don't, I think the Yankees are very much overachieving at the current moment too. The Yankees have, I didn't know that the Yankees have won 10 in a row. 10 That's straight. Didn't Ten know straight. That. Best, best record in the league. Dude. They, they're, they're playing really well. All the guys are playing really well right now. I, that's, that's great. But I, I don't know. They um, judge, judge is a stud. Stanton can still swing it, but I, it's, Rizzo, I, I don't I don't see the Rizzo trend continuing all year, but he's still a great player too. Just solid to have, you know, in general to have on the team. But the other guys, I don't know. Donaldson, Donaldson's still pretty good. Uh but then the rest of them, the pitching, yeah. But you said this before when we were talking about they're the Yankees, and if they're close, they're gonna go out and they're gonna find some other guys and you know. But my prediction of them finishing fourth isn't looking very good right now. I think the Red Sox might have uh, might be solidifying that spot, and we'll see where the the Rays and the Blue Jays shake out and all that. Yeah, that's a great point too. Where it's like <clears throat> you're gonna see a lot of teams like the Cincinnati Reds become like farm teams for the New York Yankees uh, here pretty soon, which is gonna be very sad. Uh, I have a quick one because I want to own up to something. I thought the Nationals would be good. They're not. So uh, they. They're eight and 16. They have the second worst team ERA. They've hit the third fewest home runs. Uh, they have 12 as a team. And we just talked about Rizzo as nine himself. So uh, hand up. Uh, I knew going into it, it's not going to be a World Series year, but I didn't think it was going to be like a top three pick in the draft year. Um, so that's on me. I'm sorry. That's tough, man. But you got the Orioles at least. They, uh, Soto, Soto, but they, I, I still, I'm very, interested to, as to why Nelson Cruz signed there. I still, I didn't understand it at the time. I don't understand it now. He probably had his pick of T. Yeah. I, I'm assuming he could have went the DH is in the NL now, obviously that they're an NL team. 
I know the Padres wanted him. I don't – he couldn't have thought they were going to be very good. There's no way. Maybe they offer yeah, – he's made some money in his career. I, I don't think whatever offer they gave him was probably substantially more than other teams were probably trying – like wanted to give him. So you're going to play for half the season, play well, and get traded again? Why don't you just sign with a team you think is going to be good? I don't know. That whole situation still is very weird to me. I think Juan Soto probably has something to do with that. Just the fact that, like, you you know, the the the, the power trio, I guess not power trio because they've only hit 12 home runs, but Cruz, Josh Bell, Soto, like those three guys in the lineup, I mean, that's a that's a pretty good, like, three, four, five, or two, three, four, or whatever you want to call it. But, yeah, I, that is funny. Yeah, one year, 15 mil for Nelly Cruz. I still love it. I love the boomstick. I'm going to cherish every moment that guy's in D.C. until they trade him for, like, some 17-year-old prospect. Yeah, but why would you? I mean, I guess, I guess you don't really know who's going to end up being there at the time. Maybe if you sign with the Padres, maybe they weren't going to be. And he was scared that they weren't going to be good, and it would have been a waste of time. Now, if he's if he goes to DC, and then you can just see who the suitors are at the time. I don't know. Just seems just seems strange to. Uh, a guy who's who's been in those talks every year now. It's like, well, where's Nelson Cruz going to get traded to? Because he's just forty years old and hits, you know, two eighty with fifty homers every year. Still, like, he's great. He's such a good hitter. But I can see the appeal with with hanging out with Juan Soto and and Nelson Cruz seems like that kind of guy who would want to learn more and and kind of pick his brain about stuff. They're probably, I'm sure, they've been friendly before, but. Man, still weird to me, but sorry, Nationals. Philly's been rough. There's a lot of – there's definitely some some surprises out there. I have one last one, and it's actually not even a surprise for you and I. Uh, it is just the absolute terror that our guy Eric Cosmer has been on this year. Again, not a surprise. We both saw this coming, but he leads the league in average with 382. He's fourth and on base, absolutely crushing the ball. I went back and I listened to this, like when we had him on and you asked him like, what differences are you doing for 2022? And he, he, I went back and listened. He said he wanted to get his body position more on the backside and have his hands travel more with his body instead of out on their own. I mean, I think he's pretty much done that now, right? Looks good, man. It looks very similar uh, to his old, you know, his old self. It's just little tweaks and man, it's, he looks great. He's driving. He's starting. He's hit some homers lately here too. He's starting to drive the baseball really well. But you know, man, I think it's a combination of he was willing to make those changes this off season. Obviously, he's very talented, and he's highly motivated, man. I mean, he's human. What do you think? You think all that talk about the trades and people talking shit on him and saying he stinks and whatever? You think that doesn't? help motivate him you know and to, to put in that work and, and do all that and you know he loves he loves being there they're they're playing pretty well I'm happy for him man I really I really am he uh he deserves it he he's he's just good dude and man he's swinging it well absolutely I went I looked they have a new hitting coach this year and I was reading some articles about it this year it's 28 year old Michael Bird, Bird, Birder, B R D A R. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know, but I know. Yeah, it, wh- whatever they're doing over there, and like the all seasons, uh, like changes that Hosmer is making in addition to this guy, the new hitting coach. I mean, whatever they're doing, it, it's three eighty two is insane. That's, I don't think any of us could have predicted it would be that high. And I believe Manny Machado is number two in the average as well, in three seventy something. I believe I saw that. Yeah, tied for for second, three seventy five. So, I mean, Manny's Manny. I don't think Manny's really changed the swing at all. But uh, I asked, I asked Haas, because that's, man, he, he, that guy's younger than me, you know? So Haas is older than me and been around for a long time. But I asked Haas about it because I was very curious. That's, you know, to walk into a major league clubhouse as a coach at that age, you need to be confident first of all, very confident in what you, in your ability to teach and, and help guys. And two, you better be pretty fucking good. Cause if, if you're not, they're going to, they're going to see through it. 
pretty quickly. So the feedback that uh, I got from Haas was that he, the dude is legit and that he he likes him and everybody, everybody respects him and likes him. So he's got to be pretty good. I mean, the Padres wouldn't have hired him if they really didn't think that he was he was very good because like I said that's a uh, that's a tough role to roll into at that age with that lack of experience I'll say there so seems uh, and I loved e- Damian Easley's our head coach there last year he's great great dude I liked I liked working with him a lot I don't know what well, boy you know how much of a difference that's it's really making but Haas is swinging it man he's swinging it and our our old pal Joe Musgrove is throwing the shit out of it as well. The breaking bats effect. So if anybody wants to come on and, you know, get a couple hundred points on the batting average or a couple more quality starts in the books, you know, we'll, we'll talk. Always open to it. Always Absolutely. open to it. I love um, it. So, yeah, we got uh, this week, uh, we got Pete Fairbanks, Rays reliever, um, very well known for his stare and lack of blinking while he is pitching. Uh, it was a big thing back in 2020 when he, uh, when he really kind of, burst onto the scene throws really hard he's, he's nasty but he's uh he was a mechanical engineer in yeah it, yeah we wanted to design fighter jets <laughs> 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 he, peter man he's one of my favorites we're very close uh he's just he really is he's one of a kind and the, the interview is great i know we kind of jumped around i was in a little bit of a rush we didn't cover everything exactly we wanted to cover and we kind of bullshitted as uh old friends do a little bit, but he offered some good insight in there on the pitching and the, the raise stuff. And uh, he will definitely be coming back on it at some point. I don't know when, but we'll, I said it in the interview, we'll call this a part one and we'll, we'll get in more into the nitty gritty part two deep dive into real more baseball things. Uh, whenever, whenever we line that up, I know, I know you want to do that. I have so many more questions. I'm just fascinated by this guy. He's, he's so well-spoken. And he, like you said, he throws the shit out of the ball. So uh, it's a perfect combination for a podcast. Yeah, man. But uh, yeah, let's send it over to the interview. Here's uh race reliever, Pete Fairbanks. Joining us today on Breaking Bats, we got race reliever, Pete Fairbanks. Peter, what's going on, dude? Takes a sip well, of presently, water. Presently, I'll talk. Presently sits to the guy. <laughs> presently sits to the guy most of the time reliever um i'm good i'd you know you had uh, quite a few high profile guests on so far and while i know that i cannot measure up to them in reputation hopefully i can in entertainment i know you can first of all but (laughs) i'll just say congratulations on the birth of your second child first daughter lottie not latte i'm uh not latte, thanks to my thanks to one of our overnight nurses at uh, the baby place, St. <laughs> Petersburg. Um, yeah, you know, one and one could call it quits. You never know. You're, you don't good. have you don't nobody feels like they're uh, you don't have that that middle child syndrome when they got one and yeah. one and they're they're not the same uh, not the same sex. So you know, could be. However, as every time I look at her with lid she goes she's perfect maybe we should have another one (laughs) we gotta raise raise this one at least a little bit first right (laughs) (laughs) oh at least like give her six months see how she turns out yeah yeah there was um dude i was we i went to take a covid test yesterday in case the flight you know in case i was flying back today Mm -hmm. it's a holiday week in japan so whatever instead of doing the airport we're just like taking a shot in case it would happen today and make life a little bit easier taking a COVID test. And there was two little girls in there, dude. I think they just got like their, you know, the swab done or whatever. Rain tickle. And they were screaming, <laughs> like screaming. <laughs> and my translator sitting there and I'm like, and he's like, are, are you sure about having a kid? <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't know, man. Might have to, might have to change the, the thoughts here, but it was cracking me up. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and thanks for wearing the shirt. I really appreciate that. I know our Japanese, hey, our Japanese you know, fans will uh, appreciate it. I'm I'm just waiting for uh, for you to get that dad strength, maybe uh, pump up that slugging percentage a little bit. 
You know, the homers are down right now. I'm not going to lie to you, but uh, I've hit the top of the fence quite a few times. So <laughs> then, maybe yeah, I do need the that's dad, all you need. You just need strength. that one, that extra little, mm, you know, get you would have enjoyed the, the one. Of the- we, we, we talked about it on here, but I pimped it hard. And uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> when you hit the top of the wall, huh? Dude, it hit the top of the wall, and I still don't understand how that ball did not go out. Like, I, there was zero doubt in my mind that it was going out, and uh, it did not. Still got a double. It was not on first base, but – That's good. That's good. They could have pimped it, and they could have caught it. That could have been worse. No. Oh, I would have I would have told them to take me out of the game. Like, I'm done. <laughs> just, just a solid post benching. Dude. Yes. Just get me out of here. Find me. But, uh, oh, man. J.A., we – I don't remember exactly. That feels like such a weird year, 2020. It like spring training, 2020. Before before COVID happened. It's like it didn't exist. Yeah. Like going back to normal spring feels so strange. And I don't even remember how we originally started like hanging out, but I do remember being in the in the weight room, J.A. And it was uh me, Peter, and um DJ Snell, no, not Snell. What was um, the big lefty? He threw gas that he never ended up pitching in the majors that year. DJ? Oh, DJ? Snelton. That guy? Snelton. Yeah. It was uh, us. And he was like a guitarist, dude, too. He liked kind of the same music, but whatever. We we're in the in the, the weight room doing our thing. And um, Jay, I appreciate lifting to some, some loud. Uh, like early 2000s, late 90s, mm-hmm. punk slash emo kind of yep. music. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. So uh, I ha- I was in control of the, the the tunes that day somehow. And Pete was in there. And I, I don't even remember what song it was, but song came on and Pete was just like locked in and started, oh, yeah. like, Dude, you know, oh, you like this stuff? You like whatever? And I'm like, from then on, it was just, we were, we were boys. That was That's it right, right there. You know. <laughs> everybody loves a good everybody loves a good pop punk powerhouses on Spotify. Give you a good smorgasbord, you know. Sometimes you need something yep. a little harder. Sometimes you don't. It just uh, it locks you in, especially especially as uh, a white guy born between you know when you were born in what ninety one. Ninety two. Yeah, ninety two. So old. you know if you're in that if you're in that elementary school where the years went with your grade, if you're right around that age. Yep. Why not? Everybody loves it. We still get going. Me, you know, McClanahan, Fleming, we'll get it on in there. I haven't actually seen any of them because I'm in rehab exile <laughs> right now, but I put it on every time I lift. Like, yeah, I think I'm the only person in rehab right now that uses the weight room speaker. And we're just, They're all scared. We're, we're getting after it at all times. Today was a mix of, uh, there's like a, every other song, like Lil Wayne and My Chemical Romance. Nice. That's good, Max. It, it, so you uh, got to really locked in. I'm doing yeah, something you would be proud of right now. I I've been taking dry scoops of pre workout before I uh, nice. I get to lifting because that. that's not Why like not? I need to. I don't have to worry about crashing it at 9:30 before I got to go in. I'm. This is it. That is the hardest part of in season lifting because I'm a I'm a uh, C4 pregame mm-hmm. kind of guy. Okay. Yeah. So I don't take it when I lift now. So I, it's more, yeah. probably more mental than that I really need it to lift, but it's just not the it's same just, as like the off season. Yeah. No, it's uh, ripping ripping a dry scoop of, of something that makes your mouth kind of go like, kind of make that, <laughs> that that face and gesture, that that, you know, that expression, and then you get in there and all of a sudden you got to like get a little scratch going. That's, that's what we're here for. I can't even do everything yet, and I'm still fiending for it, you know? I can only imagine, Peter. You're probably probably going crazy in there. And uh, we 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 evolved Jay from that to um, the original Call of Duty for Dance Squad was me, Peter, Josh Fleming, and T. Rich, Trevor Richards. Most of the time, sometimes whispers be sprinkled in there too. But yeah, we we uh, it was a rotating four. <laughs> but you know when you. Uh... To, to, pre- to preface this for you, 2020, right? We're in our, uh, you show up, right? You, you wear a mask everywhere. 
you cannot do any, you cannot leave the hotel in some of these cities. So we would wake up, shoot it in the group text, hop into for dance pregame. <laughs> we would get back, you know, maybe because they gave us room service credits because we didn't have, that's not we didn't really have per diem because where were we going to go spend the per diem, right? So we got these room service credits, make sure everybody's got their food, you know, everybody's good to go after the game. We hop, we hop right back into Verdansk. Just screaming sure at TVs. This is. <laughs> she has the hiccups. This is. And we'll oh, present her Lottie. To Hi, your Lottie. audience. Here she is. Oh. Yeah, you're going to start crying, aren't you? She needs her nose to be sucked. <laughs> and she has the hiccups. She's so cute. But yeah, so we, you know, we, we crushed Call of Duty at all times. And then in the in the two and a half years passing since then, man, just not as good as those original runs were. Nothing, nothing it is like not that. Done it. Nothing will beat um, that. That was Pete's wife, Lid. Uh, yeah, that was, that was Lid, son, Lottie, there. daughter. His daughter. son Isaac was with them at the time, and I forget where we were. If we were, if we were on the oh, road, we were in the bubble. Was it the playoffs? It was the yeah, playoffs, we dude. The and <laughs> go ahead, you tell. Go ahead. So we're in the bubble, right? And Lynn and I made the mistake of not getting an extra room to put Isaac in to sleep. And so he's he's in our room, right? He's supposed to be sleeping shitty sleeper. So I'm like, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sacrifice my my Lynn and I call it my nothing box time. Apparently, the nothing box is a theory that everybody needs their their outlet, more or less. And mine just happens to be video games. So I'm like, well, shit, I I, I can't. I got to find the setup. So I we had a double sink. It was a four seasons in both the, both the one in Texas and the one in San Diego. There's a double sink. So I set monitor Xbox up right between the two sinks. And we get done with the game, and if you know, if I wasn't standing up with litter doing anything, I would, I would play from the bathroom because it was the only thing that I, the only place I could where I wouldn't wouldn't wake Isaac up with either me cursing or just yeah, mainly me cursing. That would be the the number one thing that would cause a a ruckus. Dude, and he'd be we're in the headphones, you know, playing, and it's like me. Josh and and T Rich like you know yelling. I'm terrible. I'm like absolutely yelling at everybody, yelling that I'm dying, whatever. And you would just every like once in a while you just hear Pete just like whispering like this guy over here, just like trying to be super quiet about it and not wake up Isaac with like a faint echo because oh you're God. in the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, had the door <laughs> shut. Door shut, you got all those things for oh sound to bounce God. off of. And here I am. Hey, so there's funny. a guy on me. There's a guy on me. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's my favorite. I do. I miss those times. Those were a lot. That was a lot of fun. It really. Yeah, well, I mean, really if, was. You ever, if you wanted to wake up, if you, oh, sorry, wait a minute. Batting practice. I mean, you could play. It'd be night here, morning there, but you're taking BP. If you, if you want to somehow play, I will figure out how we can play. If we get the band right. back together yeah. like that, we'll get the band back together. We will get the band back. Being three we'll different countries, the United States. T Rich is up there in Canada now, and I'm in Japan. So yeah, we can. Yeah, good thing T Rich and I are on the same all. time. Same thing. Yeah, we have three guys still in the same time zone, and then there's you. Yeah, I'm way out there, but I don't think I enough I, of I that. Put money. There's no way that this is my last thing on on video. There's no <laughs> way T Rich has played Call of Duty in two years. No I don't chance. think he's. There's no way he's playing no in the FIFA. Yeah, FIFA. If yeah, that's it. I I don't remember seeing him on there very much, but you never know. We'll have to ask T. No, he it was it was games. like only, it was only with us post game, mainly for yeah. That you're season. right. He got pretty locked in to Call of Duty for he a did. while though. He, he was did. he was pretty. We got him. We got him zoned <laughs> in. Oh, I love it. All right, Jay. Let's let's get this going because. I'm going to be late for my batting. Give me practice. the OG. What's the OG time clock? What's the, what's the clock right now? What do we got? What do we got to beat? We probably have like 20 minutes. Oh, oh. dang. Right, yeah. we, can get it, we can get it Sorry done. Sorry about that. We'll hit all the topics. We can get it done. 
Okay. All right. Well, let's, you want to start in the way back machine? Cause I was, I did my research. Uh, I, I did a very thorough uh, Pete Fairbanks examination here. And uh, I, I, so I'm just so curious. Cause like I was reading about like your backstory and you said in the past that like growing up, y- your mom was a teacher, your dad played pro ball. Y- you've said that nobody liked a guy who was smart and athletic, but I was wondering how you kind of were able to balance both of those things growing up and how you're able to avoid being like, you know, that guy. Oh, I was, I was, did not avoid that at all. Um, no, I just, there's, I really, in my childhood, I cared mainly about two things. And that was being good at sports while doing better than everybody in the classroom without putting in the effort that some people had to put in. Um, so, you know, I, my mom actually would probably, she's was just as big into sports as um, my dad was. She was actually the one I'd be shooting out in the driveway and she would be yelling at me through our kitchen window of things that I was doing wrong with my, <laughs> when I was jump shooting. So yeah, my mom is, is just as, just as fiery um, probably as I am. So yeah, you know, it is. Uh, thankfully I've, I've kind of been able to throw the classroom by the wayside and I can focus that energy into other things, but yeah, you know, I, it, it's, uh, I don't know. I never felt like I had to balance it. It was just kind of who I was. I feel like being well read though, because I I I've, I heard a lot about like obviously you you majored in like some crazy was it what was your major when you went to the University of Missouri? Um, so I was math originally, and then realized that I wanted to actually do something that wasn't theoretical. So I went to switch to mechanical engineering. Which but yeah, just, uh, yeah, yeah. I, it was hard. There was only there was not a lot of engineers in the Missouri athletic department. Uh, and I don't think there are anywhere I, but, you know, I think in that avenue, if it's something that interests you and then you can make it work around, you know, both sides of the schedule that you need to, I, I thought it was, it was very rewarding. Now, have you been able to combine your love of like math and all of these things into, into your athletic career? Like when it comes to stats, do you ever nerd out on some of these things like, like spin rate or like what, what's some of the nerdiest stuff you look at when it comes to your pigeon? Um, I really only, I mean, I, obviously you can, you have all your metrics that you can see, be it, you know, your vertical induced vertical, uh, et cetera. Um, but honestly, when it comes to, when it comes to baseball, I'm more fuel based, obviously, like, I'm not gonna, uh, like it for me, it's like fuel based to get those, you know, to hit the metrics. It's not chasing the metrics at all, you know, it all, you know, at all costs, basically what I'm trying to say. I can't think of a better word than cost, which kind of stinks. Um, but yeah, it, it's for me, it's very much feel based and it's just a lot of experimentation. So I do think that that aspect where you kind of treat everything as a problem and then, you know, go and tinker basically to see what best solves that problem. I dig it. Yeah. I mean, Brian, uh, like, you know, you, you've been around him. Does, does he, does he ever have that thing where it's like, you, you don't strike me as somebody who's like a know-it-all though, but I do have a feeling that you do kind of know most things. Does like, does, does that, is that a fair assessment? <laughs> uh, oh, Peter's smart, part. dude. He's a smart dude. I never, he doesn't, uh, I mean, I feel like when you, when you say somebody knows everything, it makes them sound like they're like, talking down to you or like you know yeah like that's not that's not pete at all pete is pete is one of my favorites um but he's definitely smart dude uh fun to hang out with i love his intensity on the mound it's my favorite um if you go back like there's there's always one time the playoffs were wild too but there's like one specific moment that always sticks out to me that sums up pete really well and we were i wasn't active but we were, I was there on the taxi squad. So we're sitting in the stands with like, I think it was me, Glass, and uh, Sua. And we're in Buffalo playing the Blue Jays. And there's nobody there. Nobody there. Like they weren't even doing the uh, artificial crowd it noise. Silent. Stuff. It was dead. Just silent. Silent. And I think it was the Sunday game and Pete, Pete's pitching, whatever. And he, he, I forget who it was, strikes out somebody to end the inning <laughs> and just again dead silent you, you know the the race bench is like 
clapping, whatever. Other than that, dead silent, and Pete just comes off the mountain. He's like, let's fucking go! Just as <laughs> loud as he possibly can. And I was just dying, just sitting in the stands because the Blue Jays weren't even – they were – I think they were more caught off guard that he was just so excited. It wasn't even that they were mad about it. They were just like, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can tell you that's exactly Pete what that on was. The mound. I came in, I'll tell you exactly <laughs> that. I came in with one out. It was a, we were playing two sevens that day, I'm pretty sure. I came in with one out in the I think it was one out in the fifth with two guys on, got a ground out, fielder's choice. Um, ended up tagging Grichik out. I have a picture of me tagging Grichik that inning out at running to home. And then I punched out Biggio to get out of it, and we were up by one, obviously. I mean, I'm the guy that gets fired up and, and pick up basketball. Like, you know, <laughs> you've played video games with me. I get pretty fired up in that. Like, it just, you know, I'm it's expressive. Great. I think that's a, that's a good way to put I'm it. Not gonna, I'm not going not gonna, to not gonna hold it in. But – uh. Being a, I, I've, I've heard a lot of this because it's like your fiery competitor, like really passionate out on there, out there on the mound. But has that always been the case? And, and has there ever been a time where you, you thought to yourself, like, I'm being too hard on myself? Like, where do you kind of draw the line between being so like firing into it with also like trying to not avoid falling into the trap of beating yourself up about things? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think that I don't expect perfection. I don't expect to go out and, and obviously, you know, strike everybody out on three pitches right because that would be that's the only way for a pitcher to really be perfect would be to not let anybody hit the ball ever um and so i've kind of tempered that is because that's a very high expectation and i don't think you know obviously you chase that but it's pretty hard to throw an immaculate inning um so yeah i, I don't know i had been the the competitiveness and the, the fiery just just the aspect of, of going out there and competing i've has been there forever i don't really look back and see a time in any sport when you know i didn't have that um so yeah it just it, it doesn't it's never i mean obviously i think it is it's a detriment at times to to be like that and to be extremely hard on yourself but i don't think that that intensity is something that is a negative right it might be off the field in terms of you know, my wife gets mad at me. I actually, there's a little anecdote about that. Uh, one of my wife's friends really didn't like me when, when Lynn and I were first dating because I was pissed off about a game of rummy cube, rummy cube, I think <laughs> rummy cube, rummy cube. So like, yeah, in that aspect, I definitely have, you know, it definitely comes back to bite me in the ass when, you know, I get super pissed off about like uh, super smash bros and, you know, shit like that. But, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to my craft and what I, you know, aspire to do. I don't think that it's a negative. Yeah, but they, I think it's, <clears throat> you've also been like, you, you've also had struggles too, you know, it hasn't just been the yeah. easiest path for you no to doubt. get to the big leagues <clears throat> and be what you are now. So, you know, I think, I think we're similar in that respect because it, it's when you know what it's like to struggle or have those, the down times, it just makes it, it makes you more intense mm -hmm. about, getting it right and, and doing all that stuff. So I, I think that's just a natural part of uh, people who know what it is to really have to work to, to get where they are now. Yeah. Sua actually, uh, this is in spring training. This was, uh, I think this was after, this is after I got hurt and, and Sua looks at me, Justin Sua is raised mental skills guy. Awesome. Uh, got him watching Ted Lasso, uh, finally. Can't believe I've seen Ted Lasso. Huge friend. <laughs> anyway, so Sua looks at me and goes, are you like an optimistic person? And I'm like, I'm like Sua, I am incredibly positive, almost relentlessly optimistic. And he goes, huh. He goes, it took me a while to, to see that, but I, I definitely see that now. And I'm like, well, yeah, just because I get pissed off and I'm super fiery about like, dumb shit when it really comes down to it. like stuff that doesn't matter that i'm opinionated about whatever but like at the end of the day you know i'm a pretty positive dude when it comes to the big picture what's going on you know like with this rehab i've looked at it as uh, i just got a tax email that's no fun 
you know, it is, I, I looked at it as, okay, well, by the time Lottie's born, I'll be able to start throwing like right after. So, you know, let's get to that. And then all of a sudden you start throwing and, you know, as soon as you start throwing, it flies by, you know, so I'm, I've been able to, to really, you know, see that larger picture in while still, you know, being super intense on the day-to-day stuff. I had a question because you actually, you played with the Rangers obviously before you came to the race and we talk about mentality and, and an individual level, but I had a question about team mentality. Like when you came from Texas and you went to the Rays, like what is the biggest differences you noticed in terms of like the way that like the organizations carry themselves. And even going back to like, we're talking about with like math and analytics, like, was that like a culture shock when you got to the Rays organization? Um, yeah, a little bit. I think what I, and what every pitcher that goes to Tampa is beat over the head with is that your shit is good. Don't be scared to use it. And I, when I first got caught up, I, um, so I was told by, you know, I was triple a, uh, Eric Gagne was our bullpen coach. And he said, Hey, don't ever read this down report. And so what did I do when I got up, called up with Texas? I, you know, I started looking at it and then, you know, I started planting these things in the back of my head about what I should be doing. Um, fast forward, get traded, right. Stink. I stunk for a while, get traded, go to Tampa and, and Snipes is like, look, your shit is good. Throw it in the strike zone. And then I'm in Durham with Rick Knapp and he's like, look, the arm talent is there. We just need you to attack. And I've kind of, you know, taken that, I got tempo sorted out, et cetera. But the biggest thing was, was me and them preaching to me, Hey, the strike zone is big. Throw it in the strike zone early. You throw it in the strike zone early, you get ahead. That's how you maintain your ability to do what you want in the at bat. And so that more so than, you know, anything, between them, it was just my ability to – not my ability, but they're – you know, they were able to dumb it down for me because, you know, we all get in our heads even when we don't need to about, about stuff like that. And it was able to – the message was condensed. It was given to me, and I was able to take that and run with it. You know, and I think that I, I got away from doing what made me good and kind of got caught up in, in some stuff that I never needed to see in the first place. Brian, I mean, you can probably even speak to this too, because you started out on the Reds and then you went to the Rays. Like, what did you notice, like, organization wise? And, like, what did they tell you in one place? And what, what did they tell you when you got to Tampa? It's different. The pitching thing is very interesting in Tampa because there's a lot of stories like that. And they find, I mean, they find guys all over the place. But I do think just the general culture there is phenomenal. And along the same lines, as a hitter, they just told you, you know, we, we think you're really good. Just be yourself, do what you do. And sometimes it sounds so stupid, but it's so, it's so simple and it can be so like freeing yes. to hear that. And just, and it just lets you go and play and not worry about whatever it is, or they want you to be a power hitter. They want you to be whatever it is. They just, they just want you to be yourself and do whatever it is that you do. And just, that's it. And that was nice. And I, I do think that's why they, they make people comfortable and they make them believe that whatever it is, it's good enough. That's what they want. And that's why they have so much success picking guys from other rosters that maybe struggled a little bit or didn't play exactly as well as they, as they thought they would. And obviously they're, they're good at picking, picking talent to go with it. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta have both things. You can't just have a great culture and not hit on the talent. A lot of it comes as you, you know, you have the culture and you've hit on talent. And then when you continually bring in people that that's a big ass water bottle, when you continually bring in people that feed to that culture, I think it creates something really special. That's, that's fascinating. I, I did want to ask some 2020 race stories. So I was going back and I've listened to some of the interviews you've done, Pete, talking about that team and just the magical run you guys have been on. But like, can we, can we talk about a couple things? Like, do any memories stand out? Like, maybe some things that the fans maybe didn't get a chance to, like, know about or see at the time. But, like, when you think back to 2020, you know, what do you guys – what's the first thing that comes to your mind on that run? It was just fun. And that's really what it is, is that we showed up to the ballpark every day despite, you know, your regulations and all that shit. And it was fun. And we, we showed up, and, and it was a group of guys that loved being around each other. And we – you know, kind of took that and ran with it. And we, you know, the, the season and, and what it was is, you know, somebody still had to go win those games. 
And I think that we, you know, we're uniquely suited in that, that we, with, you know, having the two extra roster spots for a lot of it with the amount of arm talent that we had really can really conduced itself to us being, you know, in a great spot for that year. Um, I don't know. I still got to like go back. It, it's tough. I've never really like sat down and unpacked that season. Um, Cause I mean, like a lot of, a lot of the stuff that we did, we, you know, we were stuck in hotel rooms, you know, playing call of duty with each other. And, you know, that's what it was. And you know, we, there wasn't as, as much, you know, contact and there was nobody there to see it. And it was almost just pure baseball. And I loved it. I thought it was great to just take a group of guys, put them against another group of guys and just play without, you know, worrying about somebody chucking a beer can at you for no reason. Oh, gee, you got any more, yeah. got any more stories that you remember vividly? Uh, yeah. I don't have to go. Uh... Uh, me and you, I'm trying to think about, I mean, we definitely played a lot of Call of Duty that, that time. It was always fun. But when we uh, – the things that stick out most to me during that time were uh, – when we when we kept win like when we won each playoff series, J.A., they would have a little set up for us in a room so we could enjoy ourselves after after those games as a you know as a team <laughs> oh. quarantined together. And uh, we had some fun. We had some fun in Tampa there. And then, uh, but the my favorite my favorite moment the whole time was uh, when we beat the when we beat the Yankees in San Diego. The only two teams at that hotel were us and the Yankees. That's yeah, weird. So we would kind of walk by each other and slightly mingle there. And if you recall, there was not the greatest of blood between the two teams that year, uh, or really any year, but that year. And uh, <laughs> when we beat them, when we, when we knocked them out, we were on the field enjoying ourselves afterwards. And that was when uh, – I played the um, Empire State of Mind. Mm -hmm. Barstool picked that up, so that went that went out there. And uh, but then <laughs> I don't I, I forget I don't remember if Pete was there if he'd already went back to the hotel at this point. But the last bus that left, I remember I remember Glass being on there. I remember Shane being on there. Honeywell, I, I forget, but we were <laughs> we were rolling back into the hotel. Um, afterwards and somebody had the big boom box our big boom box <laughs> and i mean this thing's i mean it was not small this thing's big yeah it's big and, uh, wasn't it the one uh and, was it it was it the one that was in there it was in our little because we were in that little like offshoot room it was like a little tubby and i don't know who the speaker was i think it was there when we went when, when we got there because we had our own there was an own our own little speaker and i think it might have been that because it looked like an old school boom box yeah, it was not on this bus, but I know the speaker you're talking about. And so when we, whatever, we're, we're you know, we're having fun and uh, drinking some beers and we're on the bus just blasting music and we, <laughs> we get back to the hotel and I don't remember who was carrying it, but it's bla I mean, blasting this music, the like 12 of us walk through the hotel where the Yankees <laughs> are right wherever i don't know and just i forget i remember i got five on it was playing for a while i don't remember what song was going on when we were walking in the hotel but the party was kind of downstairs in our designated area and we were the last one to get in there yeah. <laughs> so i saw the video on my phone of all of us just rolling in with this john curtis <laughs> is going nuts the speaker's just blasting Oh, and uh, they were not happy about that, needless to say. So that that's probably the one memory that stands out the most to me that year. Oh, it, was that's funny. It, was, it was phenomenal. No, um, yeah, dude, that – going back, really looking – like, that was not – our, our like, um, I, like, our isolation. Like, we had our separate little spots out there. Yeah, that was weird. Top it off sweet. I mean, it was, the setup was great. I think that they should have, obviously, you know, Everybody likes their home field advantage. They like getting the, the cash from those. I thought it was pretty sick to have. Uh, to, yeah, I mean, even if you just did it for the World Series and just made it an event, but you know, all the, a whole week party centered around a sporting event. Why not? Don't they already do that? It's cool. <laughs> they do. No, um, I had. Oh, that's okay. I do. This is we're uh, Baltimore beat the O's 
to, I think it was just clinch a playoff spot because we then beat the Mets and got delayed in New York. That was sick. That was a different one. So oh we were in. God. Spent freaking seven hours and that was seven extra hours in City Field. Yeah, that stunk. But we were in we're in a suite, Four Seasons, Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Um, and that Four Seasons, like, is right up on the bay there. So we're sitting outside. Curtis, as you know, loves to play the guitar. So Curtis had his guitar, had Curtis guitar, whatever. So we're outside. It was like me, Flim, Kurt. I don't know if you were out there with us or not. But froze out there. And somehow somebody gets brought up. You think you throw a beer in the harbor? We're like, oh, ah, yeah, probably somebody probably throw a beer in the harbor. And Fro goes, yeah, hold on. Goes inside, grabs a Bud Light, does two arm circles chucks this thing 75 feet out in the middle of the harbor I I, just everybody's just speechless just the right and that dude just from a standstill probably threw a beer can 275 feet with nothing more than a little step <laughs> couple arm swings and chucked it yeah he I, was, uh, <laughs> I mean I live was in Maryland, right, so that, right. yeah I mean that's that's probably not the worst thing that's been thrown into the harbor <laughs> there you go now, the people have been pulling bird scooters out of Tampa. Uh, um, <laughs> those videos are funny, though. <laughs> yeah, the one that I've seen that is pretty funny. That was where, because we, we all had, we had, everybody had us, we had like probably 25 box, couple boxes of cigars. Everybody has one. Like, how the fuck are we supposed to light these? And <laughs> KK takes one, holds it like he's about to smoke it, sticks his hand up, contorts it into the fireplace through. Because it had two little glass panels, somehow got it wedged up inside, stuck the tip in to the fire, lit it, and then proceeded to light ones off of that. Which, in retrospect, I'm really glad we, nobody had COVID at that point. Yeah, that was a that whole ride was was wild, man. No one, hopefully, no one ever understands that too. No, but it, it was, was definitely just awesome. From because that was when uh, we. That was, I don't know, well, that might have been that serious, but we took the train up uh, from Baltimore. We took the train from yeah, Baltimore to New York, up yeah. to New York. And, you know, Madison, you get out right underneath the the stadium. And I think I'm like 100% positive that it was Flem goes, oh, where are we? And when you look up and it says right above you in flashing neon <laughs> letters, Madison Square Garden. <laughs> and we're just like, oh, my gosh, dude, let's just look up. Just look up. <laughs> Oh God, that's great. Let's uh let's finish with the rapid fire so I can go to batting practice. But we're gonna need to have Peter back on here and, and yeah, just well, go we'll on for, we'll get for a long part time. Two. I could talk, you know, we could talk for quite a while. We will. We will definitely will. Go ahead, Jay. Hit him. Well, speaking of talking, I went back and I listened to a lot of your horse and around podcast that you did with the Rays. I think we might have brought this up earlier. They were all really, really cool. Like you were super well prepared. They're funny. Like, do you think that hosting a podcast is something that you're going to do again in the future? Potentially. I think uh, I was kind of at a, at an inspiration block. You know, I didn't, uh, part of it with it being, you know, team sponsored, I didn't want to, you know, as OG has the liberty and you guys have the liberty to kind of go out and get whoever you want. So I kind of kept it in house just because, you know, I think that, you know, for the market that it had, it would, it would be good to kind of explore some of the personalities that you might find on the team. But I definitely, um, I would like to, I would like to get into something along those lines um, down the road. I think, you know, the market is, might be a little saturated with uh, the rise of TikTok and everybody wanting to, to have their voice, but no, I, I think that, there's definitely an avenue for it. And I would very much be interested in it in the future. The one you did with Brandon Lau. Yeah. Was, was, what would you say, OG? I said third Mike. Or it'll be the third Mike. Keep that in mind. Let's get you back in the States first, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Record them at like three in the morning, our time. Um, (laughs) Yep. Yeah, so the one we did with Brandon Lau, though, was fantastic. I, went, I think I listened to the whole thing. There's a really funny part in there because he was giving you a little grief about your coffee taste, and you're very particular in the places that you go and the stuff that you drink. Like, why do you hate Starbucks? And, I'm you know, not, I don't, you explain this is, that? This is, I'm going to talk over you for a second. I don't hate Starbucks. I drink Starbucks just as much as the next guy. My gripe is the people that would go to a new city or, you know, you're in a place like St. Pete where, you know, it's kind of hipster and there's a million different places to go. And we continually go to the same spots over and over again. 
like we gotta we gotta branch out you gotta experience the local scene a little bit i don't know that's something that you know my wife and i are big on is more places we don't want to be we don't want to go to we're not going to applebee's you know we're gonna what's up dude you're gonna get out there or you better climb isaac's <laughs> making a guest appearance um no so yeah i i don't I don't dislike Starbucks. I think that there are significantly better things to drink than Starbucks. Now, Duncan, Duncan coffee is trash. Thousand percent agree. The uh, wow. There, there's another very funny part. And I think it was my maybe one with Colin McHugh. You guys were going. We're talking about like our early two thousands, like alternative rock, like mm-hmm. fandom. Yeah. Uh, your as far as your walkout music is concerned, I think you have Bastille. Is that right? Is that is that your current uh, one? So my one in 20 was Bastille last year was a cover of everybody wants to rule the world by Lord. And this year was going to be secret crowds by angels and airwaves. But obviously I haven't had a chance to break that one out yet due to the fact that I still can't pick up a baseball. Besides that, that, (laughs) the Bastille (laughs) one was phenomenal. Still love that one. Every time I hear that song, I think you immediately. Yeah. As you should. Mike, all Pete's coming into the game. You're like, oh, this guy's a little nuts, but his song is so happy. It is. It's a good one. Slaps. Sorry, Jay. No, I was just to say, like, w- could we see Mr. Brightside make an appearance at some point? Because I, I, I'm, there's a scientific fact that nobody has listened to that song and been sad after. Right. As I say, the song is so good, they sang the same verse twice, and nobody cared. <laughs> and nobody cared. They sang the same exact verse twice, and the people love it. I actually, well, this is off topic, I love the song. I was on, so I'll... When I'm in long car rides, I'll watch concerts. I won't watch them. I will listen to concerts on YouTube. I don't watch when I drive. Let's clear that up. Safe driver. All state. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll put them on. And there were, I was listening to one from them in Glasgow. And they sang four verses of it. And nobody cared. Everybody went crazy. It, yeah, it's, it's a great song. You will not be seeing it. I had it for one outing in Durham. And I gave up a three spot and two thirds of an inning. So... That one will not be making a, uh, you know, it probably will not make an appearance. But it. I'll, I'll never say never. I'll, I'll never say, I'll never close the book on the killers. Okay. Well, that makes me happy because you're right. It, their songs are hilarious because the lyrics don't make sense and they, they all slap, every single one of them. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I heard- uh, <laughs> it doesn't make, a lot of the songs don't make sense, but I love no. Brandon Flowers. The guy's great. Uh, I heard a really great quote by you and I have to unpack it just briefly. You said that about your life goals, you said baseball's one, a designing mm-hmm. fighter jets is one B and one C yeah. is a broadcaster. Can you explain one mm-hmm. B for me and how close are we to potentially seeing you design a fighter jet? Uh, not close. One A has gone really well. <laughs> so um, probably one B is going to get scrapped for hopefully like a one C. Uh, no, I, so obviously mechanical engineering. I love, you know, I grew up in St. Louis riding right? McDonald's Southwest Boeing was there. Um, you know, I, I just, my dad would take me out to, you know, the airport for the off chance on a Sunday that the national guard would be flying their F-15s when I was a kid. And then that transferred, you know, along down the ways when I was out rehabbing in Arizona, my buddy wife and I would go out to Luke air force base. And there's a perfect little offshoot road where you can sit and you have F-35s flying overhead all day. So we got there every now and then. I just love it. I think they're incredible feats of engineering and, you know, they're fascinating, but 1A is going really well. So let's uh, hope that 1A keeps going well and then we can just transfer to 1C eventually. Broadcaster. I mean, that's, that seems like a no brainer. Uh, all right. Two more quick ones. Uh, I have to ask about you're one of the most expressionistic pitchers I've ever seen and they're all hilarious and they get memed often online our, our friend Jared Carabas had a very funny tweet about your stare. He said, no one's ever beaten Pete Fairbanks in a staring contest. I've never seen him blink once. Uh, can, can you explain kind of the origin of that briefly? Um, I, it, it's not a, it is not a act. Like I don't do it on purpose. You know how some people have their shtick. <laughs> that is, it's not a purposeful shtick. Um, there's, and my eyes are just kind of when I focus and I get locked in, they're, they're big and there's, now, like every time that gets brought up, I look up, there's a picture that my mom has on like right underneath our TV at, at their house. And it's of me shooting a jump shot and my eyes are the exact same. So I think it's just, I think it just comes with the territory of competing 
and the eyes get wide. We get, you know, kind of hyper-focused and, and it is what it is. Also, I did beat Carabas' ass in that staring contest. Love it. <laughs> Friend of the pod. Uh, all right, last one. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, your shit's good. Throw it over the plate. Um, yeah, in terms of in terms of sports, probably that. Um, uh, yeah, I, that's as, as good as I can think of for the uh, the sporting side of things in life. I don't know. I've just kind of I've kind of grown to be more optimistic the longer that I've I've been around. And as OG said, when you go through tough shit, it kind of gives you a better uh, you know a better view for for the things that that matter. I love it. I like that. As the first, as the first one who really didn't uh, go more philosophical on us, I was just like, <laughs> "You got good shit. Throw it over the plate." Yeah, so I mean, you can get philosophical. Right yeah, there's no reason to. There's no reason to beat around the bush. I, you know, you are who you are. You might as well go try and maximize it, and That's whatever right. you're doing. <clears throat> Peter, thank you so much, dude. This was awesome. Hey, I wish it was that great. I had a I whole lot more time. Be- yeah, we can do it again. But we're gonna. I'm yes, happy to. We I'm will happy definitely talk about. You can even, you know, I'm a very opinionated guy. You could even just, just get a list of subjects, and I'll give you my, <laughs> my unresearched two cents on them. We will. Uh, we could put. We could put part one, Pete Fairbanks, part one next to the next to this one, so that everybody knows a part two will be coming. Everybody knows that there's a lot so more material that could be there. Yes, and uh, we'll hey, do it on knows, the morning. Maybe you just bring me. Maybe you just bring me on as a guest co-host every now and then. That, you never know. Wouldn't hate that. Four people's, four people's a lot for a podcast, though. So probably not. But actually, I don't well, know. When we need. Because uh, what's his name? Bateman and uh, Bateman Arnett and. Uh, oh, Smartless. Yeah. And, uh, Smartless. Oh. They, got, they got three hosts and they're all. As I listened to a lot of Smartless when I was driving back and forth to spring training this year. It's definitely uh, it's definitely a possibility. We will. Uh, as long you know, next time, as long as I'm not freaking out about insurance at five thirty in the morning, we'll we'll, we'll have plenty of time. And we'll have the we won't have the, the thirty minutes to get you locked in. <laughs> it's better than coffee. Oh insurance. yes, yep, yeah. It woke me. I woke me up real quick, but I have to. I have to go. So, Pete, <laughs> thank you so much. I miss you, man. It was fun. I miss playing for Thanks. dance. We'll we'll get back into it at some point. Thank but, uh, you. It's a pleasure. It's great to it's great to be forced to to, to reconnect while you're halfway across the world. And also, thank it's you for not texting like, me and not DMing me on Instagram. Quick, quick caveat there. I don't know why I always DM Pete. I have his number. We talk pretty. I mean, pretty often, honestly. But it always ends up somehow Instagram. we're DMing Every time. on Instagram. Somehow on Instagram. I don't know why. So when I told him, I was like, I'm actually going to text you. I don't know why I'm DMing you <laughs> after all these, you know, all this time, I'm just going to text you. So yes, I will. I will text you again very soon, Peter. Yes. Well, thanks for having me, OG. I hope <laughs> that, you know, there's a happy, happy, healthy, you have a happy, healthy girl here. And uh, thank you. It's like the next <laughs> 10 days, isn't it? It's coming up quick. Yep. Any day now. We're waiting. We're waiting. All right. Good job. All thanks right, for dude. having me.